welcome to worship at Cypress Creek Christian Church. Um, as I drove up this morning, I saw the sign up there with a sermon titled, Cheese from the Chin, I think it is. So, we're not starting out that way. I'm looking forward to seeing how you get there this morning. <laughs> Hope you don't get any on your skull. Um, welcome here. God is here with us. Let us join together in our call to worship. We have died to sin, according to the Apostle Paul. The waters of baptism are the tomb. We have been baptized into the death of Jesus. The waters of baptism are the tomb where the past is there. We are united together in a death like his. The waters of baptism are the tomb from which we shall rise. We shall be clothed in the likeness of Christ. The waters of baptism are the tomb from which new life shall come. One shall live a new life of humility and service. The waters of baptism are the tomb where our arrogance and such as ways shall be buried forever. We have died with Christ, and we shall live with Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. If you're able, please stand and let us lift our voices in worship. Jesus. 
May this work continue to happen each day of every week. This is our prayerful request in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Prayer services in the chapel every morning at 6.30. Joel's going to be leading those. You're invited to come. If it's before work or before breakfast, to come out. And they're not very long, but just an opportunity to kind of set your day, especially at this very holy time of the year. And then lifting up that on Monday, Thursday, we have a service at 7 p.m. On Good Friday, a service at 7 p.m. And then Easter Sunday. A couple weeks away, we have a sunrise service at 7 a.m. And then our usual services at 9 and 11. <clears throat> a lot going on over the next few weeks. I hope that you will be able to participate in as much as you can and be prayerful for all the other events. Well, today we continue looking at Luke's gospel. Looking at chapter 14, specifically verses 7 through 11, Jesus has been invited to a meal, and that's kind of the setting for our scripture this morning. It says this, when Jesus noticed how the guests sought out the best seats at the table, he told them a parable. When someone invites you to a wedding celebration, don't take your seat in the place of honor. Someone more highly regarded than you could have been invited by your host. The host, who invited both of you, will come and say to you, Give your seat to the other person. Embarrassed, you will take your seat in the least important place. Instead, Jesus says, when you receive an invitation, go and sit in the least important place. When your host approaches you, he will say, Friend, Move up here to a better seat. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. These are words offered from the Holy Scriptures, made holy by the presence of the one that we encounter in these words. Now, many of you may know the names Peter Quill, Gamora, Rocket, Drax, Groot. Others of you may be scratching your head going, who? <laughs> well, if you know the comic uh, Guardians of the Galaxy or have seen the movies, they are some of the main characters. They are tough, strong, rugged, defiant individuals, at least on the outside. But really, they are individuals who are broken, who are insecure, who are fragile, who in fact are afraid, afraid that others will see who they really are. But when you spend your life covering up that insecurity, that feeling of, of, of uncertainty in life, when you're covering it up with arrogance and conceit and selfishness, it's hard to, to come into relationships with others. It's hard to come together and, and actually do something of value together. But something changed, and I invite you to watch this video clip. Guys, come on, I thought I was going to be here. Two seconds he expects to hear this big plan of ours. I need your help. I look around at us. You know what I see? Losers. <clears throat> I mean, like, folks who have lost this stuff. I have a 
lost my life surrounded by my enemies. I will be grateful to die among my friends. You are an honorable man, Cole. I will fight this hunch. with the words, 
All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. I think we need to maybe pay attention to all the movement, all the lifting up and the being made low, and the vice versa, the going up and the going down, and the humil humility and the exaltation. It seems to be shared in these words. The book of James puts it this way, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and the Lord will lift you up. The very words we have been singing throughout this season of Lent when we've been coming to the communion table. Is it a parable then just about humility? Like my grandfather used to say, don't be snooty. With your nose up in the air, if it rains, you just might drown. <laughs> Maybe it's echoing the Apostle Paul, who said Jesus, though in the form of God, did not accept equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself and took on the form of a servant, humbling himself to the point of death. Death on a cross. Again, lots of up and down movement going on. When Jesus was at his lowest point, humbling himself to the point of death, when Jesus was at that low point, arrested, abandoned by his friends, beaten and facing his own execution, that's when the world lifted him up, literally lifted him up. The Romans raised him up on a cross believing that it would be discouraging to others who might have been attracted to this radically subversive love that Jesus was sharing. But if anything, it put that kind of love on display. It revealed that kind of love in a very powerful and dramatic way. It's interesting how our scripture this morning begins with the words, When Jesus noticed how the guests sought out the best seat at the table. When Jesus noticed this, this trying to take the best seat, that's what motivated him to tell the parable. The words, though, here are kind of interesting. Jesus uses, well, we translate it as best seat, but the word is protoklesia. It's actually two Greek words that are put together, proto, which means first, and klesia, which means recliner, or position at the table. When people gather around a table, they usually sat in a reclining position to eat. Well, Jesus tells his, his, his listeners, do not seek out the proto -klesia. Do not seek out the first recliner, the prominent position at the table. Instead, Jesus encourages his listeners to do something different, to find the lowest seat, to find a different first, a different proto. Maybe that begins to bring something to you. We use that word, maybe not the word proto, but in our vision and mission here at Cypress Creek Christian, Church, we echo the words of 1 John, where we read, we are to love because God first loved us. There's that word proto again, first loved us. It means to go first, to lead the way, to, to demonstrate out front. But it also means prototype, original, model, example for others to follow. We do not seek the first recliner or the prominent position. We seek another first, the love first life, the proactive love of God that did not wait for us to be worthy or for us to earn that kind of love, but a God who acted in a powerful way, put it on display, including on the cross when Jesus was lifted up, when he was hung high, when he was exalted. Too often we hear the language of humbling ourselves so that we might be lifted up in the sense that if I humble myself, that when I die, Jesus will lift me up into heaven. But maybe the parable is saying something a little different. That if we humble ourselves, truly humble ourselves as Jesus did, the proto-agape, agape being the, the love of God, that first acting kind of love, then 
this love will be lifted up in us, put on display, it will be disclosed as it was perfectly when Jesus was lifted up and exalted upon the cross. But the Apostle Paul reminds us to be lifted up with Christ, to be raised with Christ, we must first die. We must first be made low. We need to remember that Easter presupposes death, that new life assumes, well, an old life coming to an end. And I think the humility that is referenced here in the parable around the table really is echoing the humility of the life of Jesus, humbled to the point of death. That self-giving, that self-sacrificing love is, is never revealed when we lift ourselves up, only when we choose to first humble ourselves, allow ourselves to be made low. And we don't get to that kind of humility by accident. We don't find it by chance. We don't claim it by happenstance. It requires us to be intentional. It requires us to be intentional about dying. <coughs> dying to self. Dying to a self-serving life. Dying, well, putting our ego in a grave. And saying, God can bring a lot of things back to life, but I do not want God to bring that back to life. This morning, I want us to think about what needs to die within each of us. If we are going to choose the lowest seat, if we are going to choose the lowest place, if we are going to choose that place of a humble servant, for if we are able to get to that point, then the love, the self-giving love that is put on display in Jesus will be found not only within us, but it will be able to be put on display through us for others to see. But how exactly do you die? How do you get to that point? In your worship guides this morning, I put three H's that lead to a necessary death. Not only what needs to die within us, but how do we get to that place to be humble where God's self-giving love can be displayed? The first H is honesty. Honesty in prayer. When I was serving a church in West Lafayette, Indiana, I was a part of a group that was putting together a Holy Week service where we were going to help lead people through confession. Confession around sin, sins of commission, those that we have committed, sins of omission, those things that we should have done but never did do. But we also wanted people to think about confession around fears and insecurities, feelings of hopelessness and shame. And it's fascinating, a few days before the service, after we had announced it and explained it, Brian, the senior minister at the church, was approached by a small group from a Sunday school class. They didn't think we should do the service, they explained to Brian. Brian was a little confused. They thought it was inappropriate. I mean, we weren't going to make people stand up and publicly announce all their sins. It was going to be very private, writing on paper, kneeling and praying, lots of different activities, but... No, they thought it was inappropriate. And as Brian kind of pushed back on it, what he came to find out was that people were not ready to be able to get to that place of actually naming all the stuff in their lives. As if God somehow didn't know. As if in confession, God was going to say, I did not know that. That's fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Brian concluded that the concern around confession by so many folks was that people didn't believe that God could be trusted, trusted to be gracious and kind, that God could be trusted to be forgiving and merciful. It's hard to have an Easter without a death. You cannot have a rebirth if there is not first something that goes into the tomb. And we need to learn to let go, to bury those things that keep us 
from living that love first life. An honest prayer is not for God, it is for us. It allows us to go deep into the closet of our souls and to dig around for all the garbage and junk that is there, the insecurities and the fear that is there, and allow God's grace to, just to pull it out and see the light of day and, and hopefully allow it to die. The second H is healthy. Healthy friendships. A healthy friendship is one where you can tell the truth. It happens sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes it ha happens in small groups. And this is not where you choose someone else that you think needs to hear the truth. And you're going to be brutally honest with that person and let them know whether they are ready to hear it or not. No, that's not a healthy friendship. A healthy friendship is where everyone agrees, gives permission, provides space to be vulnerable. I've been thinking a lot about my friend Reverend David Merrick. David died about eight, nine years ago. But I've been thinking about him because our new office manager, Hannah Fitch, when we hired Hannah, didn't know this, but... David was her uncle. And so we've been talking about David a lot later. Well, David and I, we lived in the same town. We'd go and grab lunch together. And after just chit-chatting and laughing for a while, we would move into what David called the no BS zone. BS stood for David as no baloney and other stuff zones. <laughs> And any time we would get to that point in our conversation, I would initially push back. I would be dismissive of the questions that David would be asking. I would answer with vague phrases like, well, it's no big deal, I'm fine, you know. But David just had the ability to ask that question that kind of just opened you up. And I trusted David. And so in that relationship, I could be honest. And I knew I wouldn't be judged. He pushed me. He asked even more difficult questions, but I knew that it came in love. A few months before his death, I flew to Kansas City to be with him. We went out for lunch. We entered that no BS zone for a while, but at the end I thanked David for the lunches we shared, the conversations we had, because I said, I think it's what church is supposed to be. It's those, that place where we have those healthy friendships where we can be brutally honest with one another. Sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's hurtful, sometimes it opens us up and gets us to the place that we need to be. And I truly believe it is part of the process by which we allow things to die. And the third H this morning is humor. Not hurtful or disparaging humor, no, I'm talking about self-deprecating humor. I read an article just recently by Ann Gary about self-deprecating humor and leadership. And in there she talks about how that kind of humor demonstrates a self-awareness. Not self-loathing where you're beating yourself up over your mistakes. No, a kind of humor that allows you to be very open about who you are. You're no longer embarrassed. You're no longer trying to hide these things in your past. But by sharing them out loud in kind of a humorous way, it takes the hot air out of you. It takes the competitive spirit out of the air and allows for a new spirit to enter in. Dr. Joe Jones had taught at Princeton, had taught, taught at Yale, before he became the president of Phillips University, which is where I met Joe as a freshman in college. Dr. Joe Jones, usually just called him Dr. Jones. Joe was always in a suit, tie. He was in a, uh, a shirt that was always pressed neatly. He was in shoes that were well polished. He was brilliant, he was heady, he was an intimidating figure. The third year at Phillips, Joe left to become the dean at Christian Theological Seminary. 
Six months after Joe left, two of my friends and I drove across the country going to different seminaries to see where we might attend after we graduated from undergraduate school. And one of our stops was at CTS. Dr. Joe Jones, still in his suit, his press shirt, and his tie, and his well-polished shoes, greeted us, wanted to take us to lunch. Joe was still this just brilliant, heady, intimidating figure, and we went out for lunch, and Joe ordered the chili and had cheese on it, and he took a big spoonful, the very first spoonful, with a big piece of cheese hanging off the bottom of the spoon, and I don't know how it did, but it moved from the spoon to his chin. <laughs> And Joe, as he talked to us, would turn his head, and that cheese would <laughs> back and forth. And this was Dr. Jones. Nobody had the nerve to say, Joe, there's five inches of cheese hanging from your chair. It stayed there during the entire lunch, but it was no longer the soft cheese by the end. It's now a cheese stick hanging from his chin. The three of us ended up going to CTS for seminary, but it was two years later that we finally had the nerve to tell Joe that story. He was a bit surprised that we had never told him that story. Two weeks after we told him the story, Joe was doing a lecture, not just among students, but community people, and the German theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher. Most of us, our eyes were glazed over listening to this lecture. And then Joe transitioned in an to an illustration, which is something he rarely did. And he began telling about this cheese that hung from his chin. He was funny. He was self-deprecating. He was willing to just kind of lay it out there. And it was amazing. It changed the mood of that lecture. But what it also did was this guy that we had put in some ivory tower, this guy that we had lifted up, all of a sudden became human. He suddenly became very earthy and real. And over the years, he had taught us about the love of God in Jesus Christ, but it almost felt like a lecture. It almost felt like a theological discussion. But all of a sudden, I saw Joe differently. And I saw a man who loved Jesus. And a man that was putting on display in his life, in a very humble way, the love of Jesus. And I think it took that self-deprecating humor to bring him down. Not that he was lifting himself. We had lifted him up. But all of a sudden, we saw him differently. Jesus told a parable around a dinner table. I think it had less to do with dining and more to do with dying. I think it had less to do with choosing the best seat at the table and more to do with choosing to do the hard work required to be humble. For it is in humility, it is in our work to be low, that the love of God that we discover at that place, the love of God that we share in that place, is able to be lifted up and put on display for others. It was at Jesus' lowest place that the world lifted him up, thinking that it would disgrace him. But in that moment of exaltation, the most beautiful and profound expression of love was put on display. We all got some work to do. This humble thing is not easy. And yet I believe with honest prayer, I believe that in healthy friendships, and I think with some good humor, we can get there together. Join me in prayer. <laughs> Help us, Lord God. Help us in the hard work required for true humility. Help us to die, to die to all the stuff, the baggage, the garbage, the, the junk that resides within us. And keep us Keep us in that place where we are able to see your proto-agape, your first, your first love, that love first life. Allow for us to see it, to embrace it, and to understand its power that begins in humility. Create within us 
moments where we can have honest prayer. Lead us into healthy friendships where truth telling can occur and give us permission to offer up some humor. That humor that is, yes, self deprecating, but humor that is honest. It doesn't tear us down, but it just is willing to name the imperfections and failures that each of us have. We clearly need your help if your message of love is going to be clearly put on display through us. We can't be trying to lift ourselves up, especially when we're trying to hide or ignore our real selves. So instead, through humility, brought about by those little deaths that need to happen, allow for faith to arise. Allow for your faithfulness, your loving faithfulness to arise within us and be lifted up in us. We ask this now. We ask for your help as we share together a prayer that Jesus taught, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
We do not choose the first seat, the place of prominence. We choose the proto agape, the first love, the first love that is put on display in Jesus Christ. That kind of love first life is revealed even here at the table. It is here that we we recognize our God who in Jesus Christ opened a door, created room, offered welcome. We come here not because we are perfect, not because we have it figured out, not because we are without sin. We come here because God acted first in Jesus Christ. And that love was put on display through an act of humility. May we come to this table today with humble spirits. That through this meal and through the spirit that we meet here, that kind of love might reside, but also might be put on display through us. That that kind of love might be exalted. Let us now prepare for a time at the table. <laughs> When the supper was
was over, Jesus took the cup, offered thanks for it, and then gave it to his disciples and said, Drink all of you. This represents my blood given for the sake of humanity. Do this. And so, in remembrance to the loving gift of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving. Let us become a holy and living sacrifice in union with the ways of Christ. All are invited. Let us come forward and share this holy meal together. <laughs> Thank you. 
We recognize that you are the source of all that we have, and that our gifts today are but a portion of your gifts to us. In that great circular flow of your economy, use these offerings for the furtherance of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Work of humility is not easy. We need to make sure that we have that kind of honest prayer life. We need to make sure that we have healthy friendships. We need to make sure that there's some good humor mixed in there. And I think the uh, redhead woodpecker has had it to some extent. It is good for moments like that, it really is. But I pray that in the remainder of this Lenten season, especially as we enter into Holy Week, that you will be mindful of the importance of humility, that it does not come easy for any of us, and that we must continue to work on making ourselves low, which kind of is against our human nature, but it is there that the love of God is most beautifully put on display. It was there at Jesus' lowest moment that he was exalted, but on a cross, for the love to be put on display for the world to see. Here at Cypress Creek Christian Church, every Sunday we extend an invitation. It is an invitation to be a part of a faith community, but more importantly, it is an invitation to connect one's life to Jesus Christ. Today, if you wish to respond to that invitation, you can either come forward as we are singing, or you can meet with one of our elders or pastors after the service. Let us now join our voices. <laughs>
Uh, we're going to be having the palm branches and wanting everybody to participate in our parade. I invite you to take the hand of somebody close and let us join together in our closing prayer. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in life, living love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.